check one two check hello hello come on check check hello hello check इतने तो खुलने नहीं पड़ता ये देखो चेक के नंबर और फिर खुल रहा है इधर क्यों गया तू बड़ा चेक हेलो
Hi, good morning. Uh, there's tea and coffee on site, so if anybody.
Good morning, everyone. Please do take a seat. We're going to get started. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Do take a seat. We're going to get started now. Um, let me just start first by wishing everyone a warm welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for what I hope is going to be an engaging hour on a theme of vital importance to us. The new hope in driving human opportunity and what we can do together to clear the runway. My name is Ashwin Dayal, and I lead the power work for the Rockefeller Foundation, and it's truly an honor to be here today. I want to thank, especially thanks to uh, Dr. Ajay Mathur and the entire team of the International Solar Alliance for hosting this event, and to my president, uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah, for joining us at the front end of what's going to be a busy and full week that he's spending here in India. After Dr. Mathur and Dr. Shah make their keynote remarks, we will transition to a panel discussion, and I want to thank Mihir Sharma um, and the Observer Research Foundation for facilitating that discussion with an outstanding group of experts and leaders. At the foundation, our thesis is that consuming electricity is increasingly pivotal to the ability of poor households and communities to lift themselves out of poverty. This is true with every passing day. Without abundant access to electricity, underserved homes, businesses, and communities have very little chance of achieving a high level of economic and social well-being in today's increasingly energy-enabled economy. So the question for all of us, of course, is whether this growth can be driven by a massive increase in the deployment of clean, renewable energy technologies. We have all witnessed the stunning acceleration of renewables over the last decade, largely driven by good policies, massive technological innovations, and a rapid drop in prices. And India has been at the forefront of this revolution, both in relation to utility scale renewables, but also in the distributed and off-grid sector. And yet, we do risk as a global community falling behind. There are still 800 million people, roughly, without any kind of reliable electricity connection. There's almost three, three and a half billion people that we would define as energy poor because they do not consume enough electricity to achieve what we would call a modern energy minimum that allows them to participate in the modern economy. Renewable energy investments and deployment rates in dozens of developing countries remain well behind what is needed to keep up with demand and certainly well behind what's needed to start actually increasing the overall percentage change in the sort of clean energy mix that we have. So while we have grounds to be optimistic, we also know that the world needs a far more elevated effort by the public and private sectors to bend the curve. And this is why we're here today. So without further ado, I am truly honored to start by calling on Dr. Ajay Mathur to address the audience. Although he needs little introduction, let me just say that Dr. Mathur is the Director General of the International Solar Alliance a unique multilateral organization established to catalyze global solar growth. <laughs> Prior to joining ISA, Dr. Mathur was, of course, the Director General of the Energy and Resources Institute, Terry, and a member of the Prime Minister of India's Council on Climate Change. He earlier headed the Bureau of Energy Efficiency and was responsible for a swathe of now quite famous transformative programs that mainstreamed energy efficiency in the country. And I see that he's also somehow found the time to write a new book on the subject um, on energy efficiency. So without further ado, Ajay, pleasure to welcome you onto the stage. Thank you again for hosting us. And the floor is yours. Thanks, Ashwin. Thank you very, very much. Rajiv and many, many friends who are here, uh, friends of many years and also new friends. We are delighted that all of you could join us at this occasion. We look forward to hear from you about I on ideas on how to enhance the cost effectiveness and the range of deployment of renewable energy across the spectrum and indeed across the world. We have seen, of course, that there's a rapid transformation of the energy system that is necessary to keep warming well below two degrees centigrade as we promised ourselves in Paris. 
reinforced in Glasgow. And as a result, there are many countries who have committed to achieving net zero targets as early as 2040, 2050, 2060, and 2070 in the case of India. All these net zero targets imply mass scale de deployment of zero carbon technologies such as solar and wind. Possibly in combination with negative emission technologies which sequester the CO2 emissions that are, uh, at least today it seems, would happen in any case. I would like to give a little bit of a historical perspective. All of you know that renewables have traditionally been considered to be on the more expensive side of the electricity business. We have always thought that their deployment would be possible only if there were high subsidies or carbon taxes. Indeed, that is what made the renewable sector grow. But because of this constant growth, fueled by a range of issues, be it climate change, be it local development, we are today at a point where renewables are competitive with fossil fuels. Between 2010 and 2020, the cost of solar PV fell by 15% every year, every year which represents a technological learning rate of about 20% per doubling of the installed capacity. Please note this number. This is amongst the highest we have ever seen. At the same time, the installed capacity has risen by 25% a year. And these two things played on each other. The the deploy increased deployment on the one hand and cost reductions on the other. I would like to note that before the pandemic, the kinds of uh, projections that we did about renewables fell far short of actual achievements. And the pandemic has served to accelerate the growth of renewables. In 2021, something of the order of $430 billion were invested in renewables globally. Uh, approximately 200 of this went into solar alone. In 2022, it was about $499 billion, 250 going to solar. This is important. But the problem that occurred is that this investment has been very skewed. Yes, there are other problems also. There are problems related to the kind of um, uh, uh, the kind of pushback that has occurred from the fossil fuel lobby and continues to occur in many countries. Yes, there is the problem that while electricity from solar or wind is the cheapest electricity, it is only when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing, and hence storage, both long term and short term, become our key technological challenge. But I will argue that for us, the challenge really is making this revolution, this solar and wind revolution, truly global. That there is a geographical diversification of investments that occur. I talked of the fact that $499 billion were invested in solar and wind globally in 2022. However, only 5% of it went to all of Africa. Actually, it's less. 5% is for solar, for wind it is actually less. This is a matter of great concern. The vast amount of investment has occurred in the OECD countries in China, where the risks are manageable. We spoke to a large number of investors, and globally, the amount of money that is available is huge. People already talk of, the investors who are in the room talk of about a trillion dollars available. We have invested about 499 billion a year. But the challenge is that investors are uncomfortable as to whether they will get their returns back. 
there is a lack of confidence in the countries where investments are not occurring. We need as a community to enhance that so that skewedness in development does not occur. What can we do? We believe that there are basically three kinds of things that need to be done. The first is pull in global investments. And for that, what we need are guarantees that can enhance the credit, that can provide confidence to the investors so as to put in investments. That's first. The second that we suggest is create a large number of companies in the global south who bring about this change. So they become the developers of projects. As the Solar Alliance, we are starting a solar facility which would provide some amount of risk mitigation finance to projects in Africa. And at the same time, another program is looking at identifying up to 20 startups this year who could, in Africa, who could be the Amazons of tomorrow. And the third thing is project preparation. This is something, you know, this is like the classic uh, uh, valley of death. Project preparation is typically being carried out by companies who do not have deep pockets. They are often done by startups. They are often done very locally based on the information that is needed regarding wind or solar availability. The supply chain issues, the power purchase agreement issues, the legal issues <coughs> need to be addressed. I will argue that pushing resources in this direction is the most important issue. I would leave you with, therefore, these three thoughts. The first is a renewable future is inevitable. The second is, while it is inevitable, it can become very geographically skewed. And the third is various kinds of investment strategies can help us de-skew this investment. I thank you for your attention and would be delighted to hear Raj's view on these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathur. So it now gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Rajiv Shah the president of the Rockefeller Foundation to deliver his keynote lecture. Apart from me being my boss, <laughs> Raj is president of an institution that's committed to promoting the well-being of humanity around the world through data, science, and innovation. Under Raj's leadership, the foundation raised and deployed more than a billion dollars to respond to the COVID pandemic and created a $10 billion global energy alliance for people and planet to help secure a just and green recovery. And that's really the subject of what Raj will talk about today. Raj, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, as always, uh, we appreciate your extraordinary leadership. And good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ajay, for your comments. Uh, it's exciting to be a part of the, uh, the Solar Alliance and to be here with all of you, because what you're doing is so important. Uh, Ajay, when you, uh, in your leadership at ISA, we know how critically important that entity is as a truly global platform to bring people together to uh, advance access in a more dramatic way. And I'm thrilled in your comments to hear uh, both high ambition but also a lot of clarity around the risks we face of simply not achieving the mission of equitable access to renewable energy technology if we keep doing what we're doing and therefore we need to do things differently. Uh, our leader for doing things differently is, uh, in addition to Ashvin, is Simon Harford, who leads the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Simon is here in the front row, so thank you, Simon, for being here. And of course, I think everyone in this room, I, I believe everyone in the country, but certainly everyone in this room knows of uh, Saurabh Kumar, who now leads uh, GIAP India, and Saurabh is, is there uh, for those of you 
who want to get a chance to say hi to him as well. Uh, today's session is a long line, is in a long line of conversations between the Rockefeller Foundation and entities and leaders in India. I'm always struck when I get a chance to come uh, visit India, which I haven't had a chance to do because of COVID for the last three plus years, at how long our relationship goes back. A hundred years ago, we have notes of Rockefeller officers visiting and speaking with medical scientists and public health uh, professionals and institutions here in India. 60, 70 years ago, we helped invest, of course, in agricultural research and a series of institutions and rocky docks that help power uh, modernization of agricultural productivity in parts of South Asia and around the world. And in recent years, we've been able to collaborate on everything from COVID vaccination access to the creation of the, uh, the rapid PCR test, which they gave me yesterday. So I'm, and I'm negative, so that's good. Uh, but in recent years, the most important new frontier we've embraced is the power of renewable energy technology to be a force for lifting humanity and addressing the inequities that really remain stark and present in India and in so many other parts of the world. So I'm glad that we get to have this conversation today. I, I want to mention that uh, this concept of leveraging renewable energy technology to address inequity or to create, to say it more positively, truly inclusive growth in the Indian economy was a concept that was first introduced to me when I was the administrator of USAID working with President Obama many years ago. And Prime Minister Modi had just gotten elected and had come to have a dinner with us uh, at the White House. And, uh, and I was a last minute addition to the dinner. Uh, but the Prime Minister said, he said and was well aware of work we were doing in Africa on renewable energy and access to technology. And he said, I see what you're doing in Africa. You should be part of helping to build those same types of alliances in India because uh, we had the opportunity to really use access to renewables to drive inclusiveness in society that far outstrips anywhere else in the world. And I think that's very true. And in fact, that led to some collaborations that were government to government. Government to government is always great. I'm going to try to make the case today that in order to really be successful under Simon and Saurabh's leadership, we actually need public-private alliances. And that's what the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet in India will hope to build. Uh, so when we started this work as the Rockefeller Foundation, solar panels were hard to get. Batteries were expensive. Smart meters didn't really exist. Mobile payments were an idea, but not kind of practically deployed in the context of bringing renewable energy to lower income settings. And you have made tremendous progress. Just since 2010, the cost of solar PV has fallen 88%. The cost of residential solar has decreased 56%. The cost of residential solar here in India is about 80% lower than it is in the United States. So there's tremendous opportunity now to scale access to things that should be low cost, should be high volume, should be uh, in a kind of frugal innovation context on the frontiers of the renewable energy technology revolution. The government, of course, has made big commitments towards 100% electrification. I think at both the village level and the household level, although you are the experts as to how close to that objective uh, the country has come. And I, I will just say, and I know Simon thinks about this a lot, India has the potential in the development of solutions for energy storage, for renewables, for metering, for energy management, battery management, utility grid improvement. In all of those areas, innovations from this economy should transform access to renewable electrification in 80 other countries around the world. Because India is perhaps the only country that has the scale, the capacity in the private sector, the innovation engine, and the policy oversight to drive aggressive access to renewable electrification in the manner we're describing here. And that's important because at the end of the day, on a global basis, we are falling behind. 775 million people still live effectively completely in the dark. 
3.6 billion people, almost half of the world's population, live in 81 energy poor countries. I mean, we include India in that 81, at under the 1,000 kilowatt hours per year per capita threshold that we believe is the true threshold for assessing whether energy access drives inclusive growth or, or not. And I know that's a different definition than the UN definition of quote unquote energy poverty, but it's the one that we believe is more instructive towards the goal of creating inclusive growth and development. And we ask ourselves, well, why is a renewable energy still so inaccessible in so much of the world? 6% of solar PV and wind additions in 2021 were rolled out in the 81 countries we're describing and only 0.6% in Africa. And I think we've concluded, although Simon will correct me if I'm wrong, there are about three reasons. The first is access to technology is still very constrained and inequitable. Whether it's solar PV or batteries, the costs are much higher. Actual access to supply is much more constrained. We're living in a world where whether it's uh, raw mineral materials or uh, supply chains based largely out of China, some elements of the renewable energy frontier are simply not accessible at price points that are viable uh, broadly in the developing world. The second is the cost of finance. And the Rockefeller Foundation has done a lot of work on the global economic recovery. The truth is we are currently in the midst of unwinding decades of progress against the sustainable development goals because of the debt costs, the food costs, the fuel and subsidy costs that have all skyrocketed for many emerging economies. As a result, more than 40 countries are facing an acute debt crisis. There is no new liquidity in the public finance system. And as a result, the ability to access finance and frankly the risk attributed to most emerging market currencies is much higher than it would have been in a different era five, six, seven, or 10 years ago. And third, government capacity remains limited. I think in India, probably that's the exception. Here, there's quite a lot of capacity. But if you look around the world, the regulatory capacity, the ability to set goals, the ability to put in place the kinds of collaborations required to really break through are hard to come by. And maybe in India, despite the high public sector capacity, I keep hearing that particularly at the state level, it's not, it's not all efficient uh, in the deployment of that capacity towards these objectives. So what is the Global Energy Alliance set up to do? The first is, I think it's set up to create a high ambition. We should have a high ambition. And I know in India, Simon and Saurabh have a very high ambition. Because honestly, renewable energy access is probably the single greatest chance we have to create inclusive development in the 81 countries we're defining. So, so high ambition. The second is we should be working hand in glove with governments to set policies, set ambition, understand the use of subsidies, understand the use of public finance, understand how to create the incentives for large scale access to renewables. The third, and by the way, this is, I love saying this because I feel so passionately about it. There's no industrial nation on the planet that's achieved universal productive energy access without deep government involvement and real public investment. So the idea that somehow this should happen without governments is a huge mistake in my view. Third, we should make sure the right technology is accessible. That might mean pooled procurement and the GAP team has done some innovative work in that space. That might mean more analytics to understand what optimal target product profiles are for future grid storage technologies, et cetera. It might mean innovation awards and other incentives that bring those technologies online more robustly. But access to technology has to be a critical component. Fourth, blended finance. This will not happen without public and private investment working together. GF has amassed about $11.5 billion of blended finance. One and a half billion of that are from three foundations. It's the, it's the grant money, $500 million each from Rockefeller, IKEA Foundation, and the Bezos Earth Fund. We'd like to attract more grant money, um, more commercial investment, and more development bank commitments. But, you know, that's where we are now. <laughs> and it's what we have to work with. And fifth, 
is genuine alliance mindset. And I've been so impressed because I had the chance to spend time yesterday with Saurabh and a community of many of you and others and just hear about how you're addressing the challenges forward. And I just came away inspired that all the talent exists in these rooms. Can we really embrace an alliance mindset? And to me, what that means is all of us appreciating that you are the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Your creativity, your willingness to share your thinking, your ability to commit your time and your institution's capacities to working together is how we will deliver success. So I, I will just say the last time I was here, just before COVID, I had a chance to visit Derni outside of Patna in Bihar. And I met with a carpenter who explained to me that he had, prior to having renewable access through one of the mini grids that Ashwin and his team and uh, so many others, I think that was an OMC grid, um, had built out, they were reliant on very, un very unreliable government power. And he said with, with that alone, he was not able to invest in power tools or hire people and was really running a sort of very, very basic operation. Once he had access to reliable, productive power, even though it was a little more expensive than any of us would like to sell power at to these communities, he was able to use it, able to buy power tools, able to hire three or four people, and, uh, and it was just good to see what inclusive development actually looks like in a village, in a shop, with employees who talk about the dignity that comes with the ability to work. So thank you for your efforts. Look forward to this conversation. And we'll continue to try to enable your success through the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. Um, so with those remarks, we are going to now transition uh, to an esteemed panel that is going to be chaired by Meher Sharma. Meher, for those of you who don't know, is the director of the Center for Economy and Growth program at the Observer Research Foundation. His book, Restart, The Last Chance for the Indian Economy, won the Tata Lit Live Best Book Award and was long listed for the Financial Times Business Book of the Year. Mihir also co-edited What the Economy Needs Now with Abhijit Banerjee, Geeta Gopinath, and Raghuram Rajan. He is the India columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, on the editorial board of the Business Standard newspaper in New Delhi, and an Aspen Fellow. Mihir is here. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. I'll, uh, thank you all for coming out, um, what is still so early in the morning by Delhi standards. Um, and I'll just quickly ask our panel to come on stage. It's going to be uh, crisp. I'm going to start by asking Navroz to come up because he has uh, special needs at the moment. Um, Navroz is a friend and a professor at the Center for Policy Research. He is perhaps our, one of our leading thinkers, actors, and researchers on climate change has been for the past quarter century. Thanks, Mr. And has uh, put in work into multiple things, including IPCC reports, where he's a lead editor, um, member of the scientific advisory group of the UN Climate Action Summit, one of India's major uh, conduits for outreach to the world about its requirements and needs um, in the climate change arena over the past two decades. Um, I'd also like Anita George uh, uh, to come up on stage, if she's here. Yes, please. Uh, Anita George is co-founder of Adena Capital, um, which, and we've, we've designed this panel uh, with a very wide set uh, catchment area. We've got people from, uh, with, with, with experience of finance, we've got people with experience of on the ground work, um, and we've got people with experience in philanthropy and acad academia. And um, Anita is one of the pioneers for green tech investment in this country. Um, she's had decades of experience looking at how to scale up investment, but uh, green tech is, I think, what we'll really be talking about here, and how to develop ecosystems and connections that can help investment scale up. Uh, Rupesh Agarwal is um, acting CEO of Azure Power. He comes to Azure with a long 
um, again, period of, uh, of um, engagement with energy efficiency, uh, in, in part through convergent energy in the government of India, and um, was also the founder of uh, Zero Emissions Electric Mobility Company. So um, again, a wide experience of, uh, with on the ground requirements for th these sectors. And finally, uh, Simon Harford, um, who is CEO of GAP, and we've heard uh, quite a bit about uh, GAP just now from Raj Shah. Um, but Simon is coming again with an extraordinary breadth of experience, not all in this sector, but um, we'd, we'd like to hear from him what philanthropy is thinking about um, as they approach um, this question. Um, and that's me, finally. Thank you all for joining us. Um, as you know, I'm going to keep my phone in my hand because we have half an hour and then we have to wrap up. And all four of you will, I'm sure, have a lot to say. Um, but I'm going to, um, I think, start with uh, you, Anita, if I may. Um, and I know this is a slight divergence from what we discussed earlier. But I think that one of the things that really came out in both uh, um, the lectures that we heard, the addresses that we heard uh, um, moments ago, was the crucial role that investment plays in um, ensuring that the renewable build-out is uh, both um, speedy and equitable. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you think essentially are the greatest sources of dynamism in investment and how can we improve on it in, in, in this sector in India and abroad? Thank you. Uh, Mihir, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I want to say that it's really a great pleasure to, to see two great institutions that are needed, and one of the answers to your question is exactly that, the institutional capacity that both ISA and GAP brings to this very, I would say, still nascent sector, even though we are talking in gigawatts, and back in 2008, 9, uh, Rupesh will remember, we began with one megawatt of commercial solar. And uh, it's now got into the gigawatt numbers. I think what's key from a financing point of view is to make money. Uh, investors come in, no matter how we phrase it, all the good intentions, at the end of the day, when something is commercially sustainable, viable, then investors come in. And we've seen this in solar in India. We began struggling with venture capital only. So finally, we convinced DFIs to come in into this uh, sector. And then uh, the institutional capital started coming in when they saw that the DFIs were making healthy returns from their investments in solar and wind. And that is not just in terms of growth, it's also the enabling environment that Raj mentioned earlier. And also uh, from the point of view of being able, these assets being able to pass hands from early stage investors to DFIs to the institutional investors. Thanks, Anita. And um, so now we get a sense that, you know, there is a, uh, um, of where the investment pipeline is coming from. Uh, but of course, it, uh, a lot depends also on what the um, policy environment in which uh, people are working is. And um, Rupesh, you're, you're on the ground. Um, you're looking at how these investments are actually being deployed. Um, what are your thoughts about the next uh, few years? What's, what's exciting? What's worrying? Um, give us a sense of, of the next, uh, of, of the horizon. Yep, thanks. And, uh, you know, as Anita mentioned, uh, a decade back, a megawatt was huge. And last year, you just delivered a gigawatt on a single site. Uh, but frankly, I think uh, for us as management, uh, representing shareholders who look at annuity business as something that needs to pay pensions. Uh, we are in a very exciting time. Uh, digitalization, decarbonization, we couldn't ask for more. We need copious amounts of money. Yes, we'll have challenges of a just transition. We work in the middle of nowhere. But frankly, we struggle to make money. Um, I mean, I heard 
what Dr. Shah and Dr. Martha said about costs coming down, and I've been part of that cycle. But it's really, really cutthroat. So it excites us to be here. Uh, we are committed to delivering capacities that have been laid out by the government. There is not a doubt that we'll not deliver, and we'll deliver it the right way. Uh, but there's no easy answers, is what I can say. It's just not technology. It's just not blended finance. I think from the ground, if you're asking me, the opportunity is huge. But project development takes time. And it's across countries. It's not unique to India. I speak to my counterparts in other parts of the world. Grid connectivity is like, and I'm not crying about it. It's two years away, even in the United States. So it's very fast-paced development. We are learning. Uh, we are all learning on the project, what we did five years back or two years back is not going to work in my next project. So that's my limited say, but I think uh, it's huge. We are ready for it. Thanks, Pish. Um, Navroz, um, you have a, uh, a large and uh, sort of macro perspective. Could you, could you link up some of the um, questions that we have there for about the flow of investment across borders, um, the need to, for sustained support over the next couple of years into this sector, with the, the general macro world that we are in? you know, which have declining, uh, uh, as, as Raj mentioned, increasing sovereign debt, crises for sustainability. Uh, what are the linkages and how should we be thinking about them? Right, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Meera. I'm really uh, pleased to be on this, on, this, uh, on this panel. So let me just make two quick uh, uh, observations. Um, one sort of a little bit more micro and then one sort of addresses your macro, macro point. I was really struck by the, the comments both from Dr. Mathur and Dr. Shah about the, uh, uh, the, the uh, two things in particular. One, the fact that investors may not feel terribly comfortable as yet. And I think that that's comes across in some of the other comments. And from Dr. Shah, this point about the, your example of the carpenter so at the end. Um, and I feel that we have made huge strides uh, in terms of getting renewable energy capacity up, right? The meg megawatts to gigawatts kind of story. But I want to put on the table whether we're quite as far along on realizing the development dividend that we're hoping to see from renewable energy. Um, and I think that part of the challenge is, in fact, bringing capital to get things to scale. But part of it is also, uh, and here I also agree with Dr. Shah in terms of the important role of the state, in finding ways in delivering that renewable energy that maximize productive power for the poorest. Right. And that's a policy and design challenge that certainly cuts across India, it cuts across much of Africa, um, and it may not be necessarily the foremost skill of the private sector, nor should it be, because as you say, you have to, you have, to have returns. So how do, we, how do we now, having got to kind of techn technical feasibility, address all the institutional and political issues where we get power in ways and forms that actually enhance productive capacity. And that might be taking a page out of the book from the uh, Rural Electrification Corporation of the US from you know, almost a century ago, where they subsidized productive expenditures rather than subsidizing actual power. Right? Can we do that sort of thing? So thinking about electricity as a developmental challenge. And I think that we're, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a macro point, it's a micro point. Uh, but I think that's, that's sort of a, uh, um, uh, in a sense, that's the frontier uh, uh, of a new conversation we need, to, we need to pick up. Just very quickly on your, on your other point. Um, you know, the world just changed quite dramatically in the last year, I think. We all had a story in our heads about how this was going to unfold. It was going to be uh, blended finance. It was going to be uh, gradually increasing carbon prices and so on and so forth. And then we had this incredibly strange beast of the world's largest climate legislation, which was called the Inflation Reduction Act. And there was obviously a reason why it was called the Inflation Reduction Act. And now suddenly we're in a world where renewable energy promotion is going to be tied up with job creation, uh, possible constraints on trade, real questions about the transfer of technology. We have now throw around words like friend shoring. What does all that mean for the pursuit and the expansion of developing of renewable energy in the developing world? Does the developing world, even a country like India, do we have the deep capacity, do we have the pockets to match $390 billion that the US has just put on the table? Do we have the capacity, including at the state level, of governments to pick winners and do the analysis to figure out where the best bets are? Do we have the R&D infrastructure? So what does the IRA and the direction of travel that the IRA suggests 
mean for the developing world, I think is a question that will in part shape how the renewable energy revolution unfolds. Thanks, Navroz. I think that's exactly on point. Um, Simon, we've heard uh, people talk about um, what we need from, the, from investors. We've heard people talk about what we need from the uh, uh, private sector. And Navroz, as, as Navroz mentioned, um, the role of government is, continues to be crucial. Um, in what sense do you think that these can be brought together um, to create what I think Jiat calls a positive transition? How can we think about, for example, the end uses that Navroz is talking about? How can we ensure that companies take technology across borders? Um, uh, you know, to, to counter whatever the effects of the I IRA might be. What are the ways that we should be, that, that you believe a people po positive transition can be made real? Thank you, Mihir, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, exactly as you say, our, our view of GAP, the purpose of GAP, is to help, uh, help those partnerships and help uh, be catalytic where it's not yet fully working. It's, it's the sum of the parts, this. Um, and as Rupesh said, there's no single silver bullet here. A lot of factors need to be moved forward uh, and, and come together to make progress in that public-private partnership. Um, and GAP is really excited to be uh, getting ready to launch our work in India under the leadership of, of Saurabh Kumar. Um, but we've already started work elsewhere. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a lot of work uh, in partnership active in Africa and other parts of Asia and Latin America. So, so two or three thoughts uh, emerging from that. First of all, uh, to what Raj said, that there needs to be the vision and the ambition. Uh, and both ISA and Rockefeller and Raj himself have provided a lot of that vision and ambition uh, to, to catalyze uh, a greater ambition and, and faster progress in this space. Um, secondly, uh, also, and this is where I think India is outstanding, is the leadership and ambition of the government. Uh, this must be led by government. This must be aligned to the national priorities uh, of whatever it is, uh, including energy security, uh, including uh, domestication of value chains, the Make in India program, uh, including the people inclusivity of that country. And what India has achieved already is just exceptional and, and the strong vision and leadership of the government. Uh, I personally have been spending time in India for almost 40 years. And it's, an, it's a real privilege to be now um, working with India with my GAP hat on uh, and, and seeing the incredible progress that's already been made. Um, and so perhaps two other, uh, a couple of other thoughts on, on the topics that colleagues have raised already. Um, number one is the role of innovation. Uh, Raj touched on this, uh, Dr. Mathur touched on this. We aren't going to make the progress we need if we adopt business as usual. Um, and again, India is an extraordinary lab for innovation in our view. Uh, you've got the people, you've got the extraordinary entrepreneurship, you've got the aspects of the, of the, of the capital industry, more to be done. Um, and you've got the single large market as well. Uh, you know, trying to do this in Africa with fragmented markets is tougher. So with our global view, we are supremely excited about the continuation of India as a lab for the globe in figuring out some of these answers, testing it, piloting it, starting to scale it. Uh, and then we want to help as GAP uh, to share that uh, uh, learning from inside India to the rest of the world. Um, and then I think the second one is the inclusivity part of it. India is about to become the most populous nation on this planet. Uh, and if we don't all still figure out how do we do this in a way that works for 1.4 billion people, not just those with the high quality grid connection, uh, people in more rural areas, uh, people with less easy access to not just the connection, but as Raj said, the affordable, reliable connection. That is the only way that this unlocks uh, not just inclusivity, but true empowerment of the economy, empowerment of individuals. Uh, so I think that's where the role of distributed renewables, uh, of localized solutions, uh, the interconnectivity of that back onto the grid in due course, which of course brings the DISCOMs into the forefront. Uh, we all need to keep focused on that aspect as well. Thanks, Simon. Um, so, um, Anita, uh, to, to, to return to this sort of notion that uh, we are at a crucial moment in India in particular in terms of um, 
scaling up investment in time for the kind of changes that will happen to the grade, that will happen to DISCOM reform over the next few years. Um, are we at a time of global headwinds or tailwinds when it comes for, for this sector? What are the things globally that we should be taking advantage of um, in this sector in India? And how can we build the connections that would take advantage of them? Thanks so much. And I have to thank Simon because he just gave the pitch for Edina, uh, <laughs> our sustainability fund. And <clears throat> one of the things which I think both Dr. Mathur and Dr. Shah mentioned is uh, innovation, as you rightly said, and technology. And given the urgency, as well as the huge uh, emphasis on how do we create inclusivity, right? I think technology really gives a very good answer, so something that can bring down costs, can accelerate access, can scale. And coming to global tailwinds, uh, actually the great thing about technology is that it doesn't know boundaries. And especially in climate tech, I think there's a huge opportunity for India to really tap into the clean tech market. We have the tech talent pool. We have the large market, as Simon said, to sort of experiment. And we are seeing that. So just to give you one small data point, to arrive at our pipeline, we looked at 6,000 companies, narrowed it to 1,200. And my colleague Priyanshu, who did all this hard work, is sitting back in the audience. Uh, we found that just 1,200 companies in four sectors, energy transition, electrification of mobility, resource optimization like circularity, and green buildings, which is really energy efficiency in disguise, I would say. In these four sectors, 1,200 companies saw investments of $13 billion in India just in the last six years. And we are not including the large renewable energy asset-heavy investments, which was another $8 billion. And the returns have been not that bad. We are competing with consumer retail, with other tech sectors. And really, if the urgency to come up with the solution is such, that I think if we do it without leveraging technology, then we'll be missing an opportunity. Thanks, Anita. And um, those are big numbers, in, in, and particularly on the efficiency side. Um, Rupesh, uh, in some sense, it may be the case that the finance is there, um, that the pipelines are there, um, but um, your producers in the end, and your uh, uh, the price volatility in your sector over the past year has been a, a, um, something of a shock. Um, how are, are you and how is Azure and, and companies like Azure, how, how are they managing that? How do they look forward to the next few years um, in a slightly price volatile, uh, given the volatility of pricing uh, in this environment? Um, what are the sort of special ways in which um, the sector can contribute um, to stability or needs protection? So very interesting, I think uh, what Navroz alluded to and Simon said, uh, you know, just step back, 20 years ago on the same date, there was an invasion of Iraq, and we said supply chain, to the date. And two years back, somebody said COVID and supply chain. So it's not going to be a start, stop kind of a reaction to supply chains, it's going to be the whole environment, ecosystem, and Unfortunately, uh, most of us in our hurry for transition have missed that bus or not thought through that carefully. And what's happened with the IRA, and it's a new reality that it's not just one market, we are also all looking at make at home. For us as a company to grow now, the opportunity is, because policy is driving make at home, uh, and the environment ecosystem, whether you call it PLI or the acronyms that go with it, essentially means companies now are not just worried about the price part of supply chain, which is often talked about, but also the availability. And I think fundamentally, uh, renewable energy companies like us are now hard pressed to understand and accept that we are in the annuity business, we are not traders, we cannot speculate on a certain commodity price moving up and down. 
we are going to be in a market producing at a fixed contract price or maybe indexed to some sort of inflation over 25 years. And that essentially means uh, people like us have to tie up our back ends, which is supply chain. So we've been in the news for announcing certain partnerships uh, for manufacturing across wind and solar. We've also done strategic arrangements with, uh, with countries that are not dependent on one country. For example, we've done something with First Solar which is unique to any company doing it outside as a manufacturer and as an IPP integration. So I think to each his own, but in a limited sense, large renewable energy developers who want to go a gigawatt or a two gigawatt a year across the globe are sprinting to get their ecosystems tied up in their home markets or the market which is going to be 80, 70 percent of their capacity. And not just for price, I repeat, but for availability. So that's, it's going to be a hard road ahead for us, but I think we'll all get there. Thanks, Rupesh. Um, Navroz, we've heard, I think, now a lot about um, the ways in which supply chains are, are going to be um, security, whether through government policy, commercial decision making, fear of um, future shocks are, is, is a major factor. Um, if renewable energy is indeed something that is, as Rupesh says, an annuity model, um, something that uh, has to ensure its supply comes out, uh, its uh, input comes in and its supply goes out on a regular basis year after year. Are we going about it the right way? Can we build up a domestic manufacturing base in India at the scale and in the time, time space required? Um, are there other ways of, of thinking about this? Uh, thanks, Meera. I think, I think uh, this is one of those questions where the articulation of the question is, 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 is about all we can do at this, at this stage, you know, identifying all the... Uh, uh, I certainly don't have the answers uh, that, that, you're, that, you, uh, um, uh, that we're all looking for. Um, look, I think, I think that this government has been thinking actively. Uh, uh, I mean, we have the Make in India kind of story. We, as you said, we have the PLIs in various uh, areas. Uh, I, I think I think we're kind of seized of the need to uh, engage this uh, the development of this new still relatively nascent uh, industry in ways that also bring development benefits, especially for a country like India, uh, where we know we have to create uh, you know tens of millions of jobs really, uh, uh, the various people throughout various numbers, but it's a very large number of jobs on an annual basis. So I, I think that, that some of the policy levers that we already started pulling, like the PLIs, uh, are useful. The question is really going to be, are those, uh, is the amount of money we can bring to the table uh, compatible with the scale of the task? Uh, is this then tied to some of the larger conversations going on around the revamping of the multilateral development banks and conversations around the Bridgetown agenda and so on and so forth, uh, finding ways in a sense uh, 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 where it's not every developing country for itself, because I don't know whether that's really going to be uh, uh, viable. I think we do have to think about uh, a domestic innovation industry, and I do think that the other part of the capacity story we need to address is at a national level as well as at state levels, because states are, are enormous uh, in India, is thinking about um, decision-making and policy structures that have a way of, uh, in a sense, taking an all-things-considered approach. Uh, if I have one sort of gentle uh, pushback against the way in which we've approached things, a lot of times it's a knee-jerk policy reaction where we haven't actually sat and looked at the whole range of possible options, thought about where to put our bets, and so on and so forth. It's a little bit, and so far it's worked because it's been opportunistic. We see an opportunity, we go after it, and, a, and some of the bets have paid off. But I think we're going to need a more strategic approach where it's also tied uh, to, our, uh, to our foreign policy and thinking about who our uh, allies are going to be because indeed the security of supply chains is going to require very, very careful and thoughtful sort of decade-long tie-ups. So we need to build out the capacity uh, to do this. We need to be part of the conversation around the MDB reform and so on and so forth to, address the, uh, uh, to help address the finance uh, uh, question. Uh, and I think we have to move simultaneously in the areas of uh, uh, you know, trying to find ways of, of, of attracting private capital through blended finance, but also thinking about how does the state actually build a war chest, because it looks like we're going to need that war chest uh, to compete. 
Thanks. So Navroz said multilateral through multilateral development banks. He said South-South cooperation. How are the ways in which we can get um, developing countries, ensure that they're not every man for themselves, um, as well as figuring out what our supply chains are, might be in the future, uh, French-shoring, as he also mentioned earlier, and trying to understand how foreign policy intersects with supply chains. Simon, I'm going to pick up on one of those. Um, what are the ways um, in which a global alliance such as uh, the one that you're now leading, um, can think about how countries in Africa, countries in Asia collaborate um, in, in finding their, their own solutions to these problems, the way, for example, ISA is trying to think about it. Yes, I think um, that's crucial uh, because uh, a lot of this is the sum of the parts. And so the, the partnerships that are created through the likes of ISA, GAP, uh, our backers who who fundamentally put partnership at the center of it. Uh, and then secondly, I think it's, the, it's almost a, a knowledge management structure to share those learnings, to be looking for the learnings and sharing them. Uh, a lot of the work that we're now starting is trying to uh, put prominently these um, replicable solutions that might be occurring in one country but are applicable elsewhere, perhaps with adaptation, but with uh, fundamentally the same solution that is scalable. Uh, whether that's, uh, as Raj said earlier, whether that's mechanisms to aggregate procurement and to drive down the cost of uh, smaller developers um, purchasing their inputs, whether it's around grid sc storage, uh, less with pump hydro, more with batteries. So yes, we fundamentally see that opportunity. That's a role that we are trying to play, being global and working with uh, dozens of countries. Uh, and then, but again, to, to echo what I said earlier, uh, we see India already playing a leadership role in the generation of those solutions that are applicable elsewhere. Uh, but as we all come together trying to address some of these uh, points to still be addressed, as, as my colleagues have said on the panel, uh, again, that's where I think India can both, uh, both pilot, test, experiment, and scale here, uh, and then share those learnings globally, um, and its G20 leadership this year is pivotal for that with the, uh, the energy theme that's part of it. Thank you all. I think we, we promise to keep this crisp, and I think we by and large have. It's 11.29. Um, and thank you all for, for your interventions, and um, thank you all for joining us. Um, Nikhil? Huh? Ashwin, Nikhil? May I call uh, Joshua Wycliffe to give the vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, well, good morning. On behalf of ISA, um, let me begin with um, thanking uh, Rajiv Shah uh, for making it possible here today and for sharing with us his insights uh, and his direction. Uh, a lot of what he said was so applicable to today's direction that we take. I also wanted to uh, thank our very own Director General, uh, Dr. Ajay Mato, for his direction in setting up uh, ISA's initiatives and going forward uh, where we could. And especially uh, in terms of his direction um, to be able to mitigate risks and be able to um, look at a time of insulating risks at a time when uh, things like SVB collapse and Credit Suisse issues are happening around some of the largest lenders, letting down startup businesses at a time at this, being able to provide direction for the organization and for the alliance. So we thank you, Dr. Mathur, for that. I also would like to thank um, Ashwin Dial for starting up and initiating this, uh, this whole program today. And also want to thank the panelists who are seated there for your insights. Uh, there was a lot that uh, you shared with us that we can take home uh, in terms of struggles in the business from the business sector and also the policies that are making, the challenges that we face. Uh, one of those things that Anita mentioned um, in terms of making commercial sense, that was really, really um, important and to be taken. So we want to thank um, each one of them, Dr. Navroz Dubash, Anita George, Rupesh, and of course the moderator and Simon Harford for your valuable input. We are proud to be associated with GAP and for the support that you play. Um, we look forward to meeting you over the next few days. 
And so thank you all. We also want to thank the 14 missions um, that responded to our invites, and they are here today. And thank you, my our colleagues who put in hard work, uh, Nikhil and team, and the admin team. It's been a great turnout today. I see the f room full and uh, a lot of brain power here, so I wish um, we could have more time, and I, I'm hopeful that you could have a good net networking time as you join us for refreshments across the room, so you could spend more time and share your experiences and knowledge. And if I've left out anyone's name in thanking, please accept my apologies, but thank you all very much for being here. Thank you.